I am Associate Director of Programs for Lila Spenson Latin American Styles and Collections. If you have been watching our last events, you will know that we have been reminding people about taking advantage of this period of early voting, which ends in October 30th here in Texas. We uh, advise you to go to vote.org to learn about polling locations. And please vote because your community needs your voice. Today, we are hosting the event, Who are the Black Revolutionaries? Resistance in Cuba and the state's boundaries then endured. As we had mentioned before, we are delighted when UT Austin recruits new faculty who specialize in Latin America or Latino Latino studies. Our series, Lila's new faculty presentation, highlights new members of our academic community. Today, we're welcoming a new affiliated faculty, Dr. Danielle Clillen, who is an associate professor in the Department of Mexican American and Latina Latino Studies. She also holds a secondary appointment in the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies. She received her PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in political science. She also holds a master's degree in Latin American studies, which makes us very happy in the US. Her work focuses in comparative racial politics, black public opinion and racial inequality with a focus on the Spanish-speaking Caribbean and the United States. Her book, The Power of Race in Cuba, is the winner of the 2018 Best Book Award from the Race, Ethnicity, and Politics section of APSA. Her latest work focuses on Blackness within Latino communities. Today, we are also very thankful to Dr. Marisol Lebron for accepting to join us in this event. She's assistant professor in the Department of Mexican American and Latino Latino Studies, and currently she's part of the leadership of the newly elected board of the Puerto Rican Studies Association. Dr. Lebron received her PhD in American Studies from New York University. I have to say that both of them are great on Twitter, so please, please follow them. Dr. Cleland will present for 30 minutes and then Dr. Lebron will interview her. We will close with questions from the audience, but please post your question early. We want to make sure that we can collect them. Thank you, and Dr. Tulian, please go ahead. Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone at LILAS for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's my first talk for UT, so I'm excited to be doing it. I want to start a little bit by just saying um, how I came to this essay. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. How I came to this essay. Uh, it, I, I, of course, work on Cuba. That's what my first book focuses on. Um, but I've recently moved to looking at Black Cuban experiences in the US. And so as I was doing that, um, I have been able to join with Devin Spence Benson, who is a historian at Davidson College, and we have started an oral and political history of Black Cubans, particularly focusing on the period before the Madiel boat lift. And for those of us who know about Cuban migration, many people point to Madiel as the point where Black Cubans started to come over to the US. However, Black Cubans were coming over in 59 until 1980 as well. And so we wanted to highlight this experience, looking at experiences with Jim Crow, looking at racial segregation, housing discrimination, and how Black Cubans formed community during that time. And so in doing that, we also wanted to look at Black support for the Cuban Revolution and look at the different ways in which Blackness can change or uh, create a different positionality when it comes to politics and the revolution in particular. And so by doing that, we ended up not only looking at this transnational approach to migration, looking at why folks left Cuba in addition to what their experiences were in the US, um, but also kind of rethinking what we call the Cuban diaspora. And so 
this, this essay came about because this oral history project has really changed the way I think about the Cuban diaspora here in the US and has really changed the way I also think about the Cuban revolution, even after having written an entire book about it. Um, and that's particularly because in interviewing folks that came over to the US, we ended up interviewing a lot of black activists that were trying to push racial conversations in Cuba and were repressed because of it. And so in this sense, I, you know, in, in writing this essay, I was really thinking about you know, how, who are black revolutionaries? Are they only on the island, right? Or are they living here as well, having been forced out of the island because of their positions? But also there are many leftists that have come over that weren't necessarily against the revolution, but wanted the revolution to push this issue of race, racism and racial inequality and ended up finding themselves as um, enemies of the revolution. And so, you know, thinking about um, leftists, you know, being in the US is not necessarily what we think about when we think about the Cuban diaspora or the Cuban exile community, but also when we, you know, think about who are the enemies of the revolution or who are made enemies of the revolution, a lot of the times we don't think about leftists in that sense either. And so these are kind of the, the, the relationships, you know, that I was challenged by. And, and so some of these interviews I want to present to you all today. Uh, and then hopefully we can have a conversation about not only who we consider revolutionaries, who, who is part of this, this move toward more racial equality, but also what kinds of black activism are accepted by the state, particularly when white supremacy is something that has survived regardless of the political um, system. And so um, I'm going to read a little bit of the essay and then I'm gonna to move to some slides to talk a little bit more informally. So in the mid 1970s, a young militant joined a group of friends in their twenties to create a chapter of the Black Panther Party in Cuba. The party in the United States, as well as the knowledge and contact they had with Huey Newton, Eldridge Cleaver, and George Jackson, led them to want to engage in similar activism and protest. Their story is one that few are familiar with because they were quickly detained by the government security apparatus. Although they did not experience significant punishment, the man shared with me that he will never forget the security officer told him, you wanna create the Black Panthers here? The only Black Panther in Cuba is Fidel Castro. Those familiar with racial politics in Cuba should not be surprised that a Black Panther Party was not welcome in Cuba. Despite the Cuban government's early support of Black activism in the United States, they prohibited that same kind of organizing on the island. So essentially folks would come over thinking that they would be able to continue a liberation movement in Cuba and were told that they could not. Nonetheless, the boundary that the officer delineated after they let him go was telling. He said, you can grow your Afro to the top of the city if you want to, but the next time you do something in the street, you will be back here. Scholars argue that at different moments during the revolution, there have been openings and retrenchment for anti-racist activists. For the past two decades, Cuba has experienced such an opening where activist organizations, academics, art, and hip hop within state institutions show that indeed black folks can express messages of black affirmation and bring attention to racism within the public sphere in ways that they could not before. This debate and the actors consistently dedicated to anti-racist activism throughout these two decades seem to have inspired a further opening on the part of the state. In November of 2019, President Diaz-Canel announced that the government would create a national program against racism and racial discrimination. While many received this news with optimism and relief, it remains to be seen what the scope of the program will be. Until this announcement, it's crucial to emphasize that the past opening following the economic crisis in the 1990s has maintained certain boundaries where an activist who aligns with the revolution can suddenly be thrust into its opposition. To be a black revolutionary defined as someone who fights for black equality, progress and power has always involved a contentious relationship with the Cuban state. Nonetheless, the term itself, black revolutionary is often connected to those that fight within the system and align themselves with the Cuban revolution. These positions, however, can put activists at risk of being considered counter revolutionary if certain boundaries are crossed. Moreover, there are many both in and outside of Cuba that align with leftist politics, but are left out of the public sphere because one, they're banned due to a critical, critical view of the revolution's relationship 
with racial equality and structural racism, and or two, they are private citizens who are not given a space to express their views about anti-Black racism in Cuba. The young militant I referred to in the opening paragraph and most of the people that joined him to build the Black Panther Party in Cuba are currently living outside of Cuba for these reasons. The tension between Black power and the Cuban state necessitates a wider definition of what it means to be a Black revolutionary. A wider ideological space or a wider net to include those outside of Cuba, as well as Cubans that remain in private spaces outside of the public sphere. To be a Black revolutionary now and throughout the life of the Cuban revolution includes an assessment of the revolutionary project that is very different from the dominant narrative. And the dominant narrative continues to be that structural racism does not exist. It requires this contentious relationship, it requires risk. This essay not only asks who are Cuba's black revolutionaries, but what have been the boundaries since 1959 in which they have had to live, act, and dialogue. Generations of black revolutionaries since the start of the revolution, because of their support of black power, have resisted the boundaries of the state, but this hasn't come without retribution. Cuba provides us then with a lesson that a socialist state in the Western hemisphere will not yield a black liberation movement any more than a capitalist one. I'm arguing that the state has left little option in particular for fighting structural racism in Cuba. Racism that manifests institutionally within the various sectors of the Cuban government, economy and society, such as housing, media, employment, political representation and the criminal justice system. This is primarily due to the fact that attitudinal forms of racism or racial prejudice continue to be the kind of racism that the state will acknowledge and permit for public dialogue. Even the unprecedented November 2019 announcement identifies racism not in politics, but in the culture of a group of people. Racism can be found in quote jokes, certain attitudes at the societal level, for example, in the non-state sector with certain employment announcements that specify skin color. And indeed on one of the um, um, internet sites where they're advertising jobs called Reolico, there was, a, um, there was an ad that you know, requested um, lighter skin people for the job. But that of course is outside of the state. There is no doubt that the government's announcement has the potential to signal a new further opening on the discussion of racism in Cuba. The government, however, will have to acknowledge their role in perpetuating and or maintaining structural racism in Cuba, which until now and through the recent announcement has not been the case. The presence of structural inequities, racial discrimination, and, even un and uneven access to the new economy affects the lives of many black people in Cuba. While some may argue that the rise of black exclusion can be found primarily within the private sector as a result of the introduction of capitalism, the public sector is not egalitarian. Employment discrimination, unequal treatment from the police, black representation both within politics and the media are present within the public sector. Despite these realities, there is limited discursive space for those that are critical. For this reason, including Cubans in private spaces that make up the racial micropolitics of the nation is essential to understand narratives within black communities. Black activists collide with the Cuban government, particularly when articulations of blackness and equality move beyond affirmation. And that's really what I wanna talk about today is that affirmation is really the boundary that we see. The boundary for black revolutionaries. If black expression focuses on black pride and recognition, rather than structural inequities, it's permitted, much like the Afro, right? Promoting black pride, black gratitude, black success, or even black exclusion is treated much differently than any discourse that places racism within the country's institutions and thus requires government accountability and a systemic restructuring. The Afro that the security officer was willing to allow is a benign display of black affirmation that doesn't threaten the existing racial order or white hegemony. Conversely, those that have tried to cross this boundary without state consent have either left Cuba or experienced silencing or retribution. The boundaries that the state has created to limit the diversity in which black revolutionaries have been able to express their visions have remained consistent throughout the life of the revolution. The state has one vision for what the black revolutionary should be, adhering to the dominant narrative of racial democracy and in support of the state, its policies and its silence regarding structural inequities. Consequently, black support of the revolution has required self-censorship among many. What is <clears throat> the way in which one can critique racism within Cuba without being punished for it? And so those are some of the things that I wanna talk about today through the interviews. Um, and I say that this project really has changed my views on Cuba because, you know, anyone that would talk badly about Cuba, I would always defend, right, the revolution and, and all of its accomplishments. 
even knowing that, of course, racism exists um, and the revolution has been silent about that. Um, but I think that as we see, you know, what has really happened among some of these activists, we really have to think about, you know, um, the ways in which white, white supremacy works both within socialist um, and capitalist environments. And so, <clears throat> Some of the interviews that I'm using just as a reference, um, thus far we've done 89 open-ended interviews with Black Cubans. Um, they've been conducted throughout the country, but we have a real focus in Miami um, and respondents range in age. Uh, and we are looking at issues of housing discrimination, educational opportunities, et cetera. But today I really wanna talk about reasons for migration and experiences among racial activists. Um, and so this, this ideology of racial democracy operates independent of regime type. Um, and, you know, and Cuba really has a hold on racial democracy because they made such sweeping changes initially during the, the start of the revolution to equalize um, class, to universalize education. And so in this sense, racial democracy is particularly powerful and folks that you talk to will say um, that there is no structural racism. And so this is not just about the state narrative, this is also about you know, what people believe about how racism operates. Um, and so I'll skip over here. And so as you know, I'm sure that many people know this history of Cuba, but in 1961, Fidel Castro essentially declares that racism has been solved. Um, after he implements desegregation, um, there's a kind of, you're welcome, we've solved it, now let's move on. And by let's move on, that meant that any kind of dialogue about racism um, was prohibited from the public sphere. And so that's where black activists find themselves in the early 1960s. And so throughout the history, since the 60s up until today, you have a history of black resistance that really has not been documented very much. Um, black activists have been challenging, um, you know, the issue of racial inequality since the beginning. Um, Carlos Moore and Lillian Guerra write about this um, in 1968 with a black manifesto that was presented to the government um, in which those that presented it to the government were then repressed in various ways or silenced in various ways. Uh, government insiders have also tried to challenge the lack of action on racism. And then starting after the fall of the Soviet Union, when you had this political opening in the 1990s, activist organizations started to come up, mostly made up of writers and scholars um, that wanted to now push this issue um, because there was more tolerance of some of the critiques of the revolution. Blogs have also been really important in communicating these ideas. And a lot of the activists that are involved in some of these organizations are also producing blogs. And the blogs are happening both among Cubans on the island and Cubans that are outside. And so again, right, I wanna kind of expand our definition, our definitional boundaries of what is a black revolutionary and what is the role of the Cuban diaspora in talking about these critical ideas and certainly you know those that are actively engaged are you know part of this dialogue what i did find among activists from the 60s and 70s is that many of them were fatigued and didn't necessarily want to play an active part anymore because of all of the experiences that they had um, with the cuban government and so i find that those that are really talking about this are among the younger generations outside of the island um, the other part of this is that more people now have access to the internet in Cuba. We have Wi-Fi spots, we have 4G now. And so people have access to data you know, on their phones, they have access to social media. And so that really changes dramatically the way that people can share information. And so it's no longer, um, you know, before people were sharing via USB um, or you know, jump drives as far as information sharing was concerned. But now people can share things a lot more quickly. People can take videos, pictures, um, and put it on social media. And so that's also changing the dialogue and the way that people are able to um, talk about these issues. And it also changes the way the state um, needs to respond because certainly 
this becomes more of a threat when people are, are talking about issues of racism uh, more widely. And so many outside of the state that tried to form organizations in the 60s and 70s were repressed or silenced. Um, but I also found that state actors that were within the government, whether they be ambassadors or government officials, um, were treated a bit differently. They weren't necessarily repressed. Um, sometimes they were asked to leave Cuba. Um, or sometimes they were sent away to other countries to serve. Uh, but there were various strategies that the Cuban state has used to try to silence a lot of these actors. Others who might, been, who might have been outside of the state were um, brought in as members of the government so that they would no longer uh, feel like outsiders. But of course, they were also co-opted in ways so that they would not um, continue the dialogue. So some of the interviews that I collected from racial activists from the 60s and 70s were you know, really interesting in both the kind of transnational relationships of the African diaspora that existed, um, but also the way in which the state reacted um, to these um, activists. And so um, one person told me, we met some Americans like Eldridge Cleaver and I became very close to Huey Newton. We were influenced by them and George Jackson and we created informally a branch of the Black Panther Party in Cuba. We were in our twenties, that is when our problem started. We were trying to alert the government about racism in Cuba from a leftist perspective. We weren't right-wing Cubans from Miami, so they didn't know what to do with us. We were harassed, but we were never incarcerated. We knew who Lumumba and Cabral were. We supported Mandela. We were on their side and they knew it. But if you go to the jails and 80% of the inmates are black, in the higher echelons of government, they are white. At the same time, a lot of teachers and scientists are black. You know it's complex. And, and this is really important because a lot of the changes that allow for folks to believe that structural racism doesn't exist happened in the education and the medical sectors. And so as you had 250,000 people leaving Miami in 59 and 60, you had voids in a lot of these sectors that needed to be filled. And so the universalization of education, the opening up of the university, um, the opening up of these job opportunities really served as a path for blacks and mulatos to be able to move into those sectors. Um, and so you do have this kind of, um, these gains in racial inequality in some ways, but at the same time, you still have spaces that remain completely white. And so that is, you know, part of this kind of illusion of, you know, is there racial equality, is there not? Another activist says, in the year 61, 62, 63, 65, Consciousness was forming around Cuba being a discriminatory country and we needed to solve these problems. But the problem of racism is not solved with speeches. You have to implement something more central from the leadership. We had a lot of influences from Africans and North Americans who were coming into Cuba. That was constant and Caribbeans also like CLR James. And a lot of these conversations were happening, um, you know, as Cuba would bring folks over, they would then connect with um, intellectuals and artists and writers uh, and activists that were really interested in these questions, but didn't necessarily have the space to organize. Um, and so the, the ability to organize was extremely important because it was a space that was left out to Cubans. Um, whereas if we think about, you know, the Federation of Cuban Women, for example, or some of the youth organizations that existed, particularly among university students, there were spaces for you know, other uh, cleavages to try to uh, talk about existing inequalities. And so that space that was left open was often um, nourished by activists that were coming from different countries. Um, and a lot of these exchanges were really important for building some of that consciousness. Um, for me, the cause was always about black Cubans. They used to call me the head of this movement. In the 1960s, in a public conference, I asked, I would like to know why Afro-Cubans and the Afro-religious currents that participated in majority numbers in the wars of independence, why are they repressed? And that is when I started to get into trouble. They don't arrest you right away. They start giving you heat. They keep you from being able to move around. They make your life impossible. They kick you out of here, out of there. They kick you out of everywhere. And this particular activist did end up getting arrested and he was um, talking to me about his experience of being 
a prisoner for a little bit over a year. Um, and this was in 1969. And so he doesn't actually leave Cuba until 1980. And so there was um, a pretty long period. And, and that's the case for you know, other activists um, that were silenced or lost their jobs or were arrested. There was a pretty long space from when they were arrested or released and when they could actually leave Cuba. And so that space was spent right without steady job, um, you know, without some of the connections that they had enjoyed before. Um, some were, you know, academics that could no longer teach. And so this represented a long period of time where, as we might imagine, you know, one doesn't necessarily want to engage in activism again when they get to this country. Um, and so that same person says, and now all of these discussions about identity, nationality, I don't care about anymore. And I haven't for a long time because of, I have had to live through a process of evaporation. I evaporated. I stayed, but I became nothing. I have had to reconstruct myself little by little. I reconstructed myself so that I could live anywhere and nothing was connected to being Cuban. That has passed. I defended my nationality, black people, injustices. I spent half of my life struggling and defending lost causes. And so in his mind, he's really thinking about um, you know, this struggle as being a lost cause, not only in Cuba, but in the United States as well, which I thought um, was a bit depressing, but also, um, you know, indicative of the kinds of, um, you know, traumas that are associated with being um, a political prisoner. Um, now his wife, so they, so he, this person came in 1980 and his wife also came in 1980 um, during the Mario boat lift. And so she came and she still was very interested in being an activist and talking about anti-blackness and talking about racism in Miami. Um, and so she um, talks about you know, her experiences. And so in Cuba, she says, we wanted to make a series of demands and claims and we thought to direct them specifically at Almeida. And Almeida was a, um, a black government official that um, has passed away since. Everything was discovered through a person that had infiltrated the group. And many of the activists told me that, you know, they would meet, um, they would try to start something, uh, particularly when they were students or, you know, um, newly on the job market, and that they would have um, a series of informants that would come in, you know, to the meeting and try to, um, you know, infiltrate the group. And, you know, all of these stories reminded me very much of stories about Pro, stories about the Black Panther Party here, the Young Lords Party here. And so certainly, you know, this, this kind of pattern of state infiltration um, of Black networks and Black organizations, um, again, right, is similar in a capitalist or a socialist uh, setting. So it's more about um, the threat of Black power rather than what kind of economic or political system exists. Um, we were investigated in our homes, our places of study and work, and in our friend groups. I was treated as if I were a criminal. In 1980, I decided that by whatever means and at whatever cost, I am leaving Cuba. Um, and she came in 1980, her brother came along with her. Um, this was the Torres family. And um, her brother, who was very funny, uh, told me, um, and he was also involved in a lot of these efforts. He told me, you know, um, when Mariel happened, you know, I was walking down the street and my neighbor says, you know, hey, you know, we're going to the Peruvian embassy and we're gonna try to, you know, leave Cuba. And he said, I packed my bag and I just went with them, you know, within an hour. And so there was this, you know, sense that, um, you know, there wasn't any way that they were going to be able to push this issue in Cuba, you know, without being harassed. Um, and so for them, the, the, the logical next step um, was to leave, you know, for many others, um, they're still there. And I think it's important, you know, to note that many of the activists that are there now were part of you know, some of these groups and decided that they would stay um, or perhaps you know, weren't targeted um, and are still working. Um, but certainly you know, there were folks that, that you know, made the decision that they could not um, stay in Cuba. All of this of course is before the fall of the Soviet Union where you have a political opening um, and you have kind of a new set of critiques that are available as the island falls into an economic crisis um, and has to reinvent itself. Um, and so, you know, 
this is when you start to have these small organizations. This is when the hip hop movement also begins. We're talking about the, the 1990s. Um, and so you have a lot of cultural resistance, you have expression, you have a lot of challenges also to this, um, to this idea of black inferiority. So you have you know, um, messages of black pride and expression that happen all at this time. Um, but there are limits to this critique. Um, and the limits um, I argue are really about, you know, what kinds of, you know, pro-blackness are you expressing? Um, and so one of the activists um, that is on the island today told me, we are seeing racist acts even more after the special period. This has become a problem and now people are saying that we have to denounce this. We have to organize to address these racial conflicts, but it's very hard for someone to address a singular racial incident and address the practice that is institutionalized. It's also very hard to participate in an individual act of social activism without being accused of something else. So we have to organize in an open space. We have to organize together. And so there are clear strategies I think that folks have taken to try not to be um, seen as an enemy of the revolution. Um, but most of the spaces that have really flourished have been about affirmation. Um, a lot of the state approved discussions really ignore the issue of structural racism. Um, and when I was living in Cuba, uh, I went to many of the debates that existed. Um, the vice minister of culture was often at these debates, um, but never necessarily acknowledging the legitimacy of the claims about racism and never necessarily making um, a promise to really address them. Uh, and so there was a sense that you know, we'll let you have this debate, um, but that's, you know, as far as we're going to go. And so what does affirmation look like? Um, there are organizations that exist today. Um, a lot of the hip hop talks about black affirmation. There's scholarship writings, um, events, art installations, commemorations of uh, the independent party of color, uh, commemorations of the abolition of slavery, music, debates, even academic discussions, book discussions. Um, all of these exist in a pretty open space in Cuba today that didn't exist before. Um, some examples that I have here are um, Club Espendru and Regla Sol, which um, focuses on Black affirmation, Black pride, um, Black veganism. And so a lot of these uh, spaces are vital, um, you know, in, in claiming that affirmation is the only way that you can comfortably talk about anti-Blackness um, is not to say that these spaces are not necessary, they certainly are. Um, but it is to mark this kind of boundary or limit to you know, what you can say and how far you can go with these kinds of discussions. Um, there are unions of scholars and hip hop artists um, and these debates have really moved beyond the state institutions even though many of them were born through UNEAC which is the union of Cuban writers and artists. And so now that we're seeing things move outside of state institutions, we're seeing people on social media, access to the internet, people on their phones. Um, at the same time, you know, the economy is continuously challenged, particularly during these times. Uh, you have an increase in racial inequality as you have more capitalist reforms. Um, folks that have access to remittances are often white Cubans. And so as you have some of these gaps that are growing while at the same time having access to the internet, it becomes something that is now more discussed in private spaces. A lot of which I talked about um, in my book as these kind of being the foundations of black solidarity um, you know, and black political thought. And so unions now are forming among these non-state actors that are proving to be, um, I think, potential for a different kind of um, discussion. Um, and so I wanted to give an example of this, um, and I have an example of it in the essay that I wrote. Um, 340MS is a hip hop group that um, exists on the island. They talk quite a bit about black consciousness, um, but also they're one of these groups that are really pushing the boundaries of what you say and what you, um, or what people are you know, used to hearing when it comes to um, the government and to politics. And so um, they have you know, received you know, some government surveillance. 
um, they haven't necessarily been, you know, harassed um, or repressed. However, you know, I think it's a an important representation of how the dialogue is changing and how it's changing fast. Um, and so I'll just play a little bit of this, um, and you have some of the lyrics here on the screen. El proceso electoral pa que la presión te suba. Voto sí, somos Cuba. No, ustedes son Cuba. Nosotros somos la cara B sin duda. Revolución no es opresión ni amargura. Revolución no es censura. Revolución es cambio constante. Yo voto no a la dictadura. Un montón de descarados. No es culpa del tornado, es culpa del Estado. Ya yo estoy cansado de ver a mis hermanos sudando. Por 15 se use cada mes hasta cuando no te marque, no te meten eso. Como ciudadano es mi derecho y como artista revolucionario es mi deber por cualquier medio necesario. Eso es yo solo interés por cambiar la constitución. Esto a quien le conviene, no fue el pueblo quien lo pidió. Nueva imagen, una nueva carta magna y un nuevo presidente por el que nadie aquí votó. La historia se repite, pues ahora cada cinco años habrá nuevos gobiernos títeres para cuidar los intereses sin duda de todo el mundo sabe en realidad que manda en Cuba una sola revolución contra la colonia neocolonia y habrá neomanipulación de las masas, propaganda en tu casa, el trabajo, la escuela y donde vaya tu imaginación. Ver con Sosa, marcha de las antorchas para empujar el voto al sí, pues se cagaron en Martí. A unas 24 horas del tornado, dejan claro cuáles son las prioridades del Estado. Que no hay aceite, harina, pal, pan, ni... Okay, so I'll stop it there. Um, but, you know, when I first heard this um, song, I thought, oh my God, <laughs> somebody's going to come get them and they're gone. Um, because, you know, I've never really heard this kind of dialogue before. Um, and, and, you know, and perhaps we can, you know, talk about this in the Q&A, but it's really important to, you know, point out that these folks consider themselves to be revolutionaries, right? These are not folks that are part of the dissident groups. These are not folks that are part of the right. These are folks that consider themselves on the left, um, that are pro-revolutionary, but, um, you know, are really pushing some of the contradictions that exist. Um, between, you know, what the government is saying and what is actually happening, you know, in the streets, in people's homes, et cetera. And so, you know, um, this was in response to the vote uh, to approve the constitution last year. Um, and so they have, you know, many others that talk about, you know, neo-colonialism, um, internal colonialism within, uh, you know, Cuba. And so really kind of thinking about, um, you know, how these boundaries are being pushed um, is important. It's also very interesting that they are now uniting with other hip hop groups that in the past have been very close to the Cuban state uh, and affiliated with the Cuban rap agency. And so in that case, I think that, you know, some of these changes that are happening are also happening among folks that used to be part of, um, you know, the, what we would consider um, supporters of the revolution but are, you know, speaking a little bit differently than they used to and really kind of questioning, um, you know, some of the, some of the boundaries that exist. Um, and so I'm running out of time, so I'll skip this, but I want to, um, I want to point out, right, that the private, these private spaces, I mean, this space, of course, of hip hop is, of course, public, but some of the private spaces that are consuming hip hop, but that are also talking about you know, um, racism, uh, sharing experiences of racism, sharing, you know, um, what this unique experience of what it means to be black in Cuba are really these kinds of foundations of black solidarity and what would be a black movement. And so when I was there, um, you know, doing my research for my book um, and I asked whether black people should organize, 60% uh, said yes to some degree, right? Either strongly agreeing or agreeing. And so that's huge when we're thinking um, you know, what do people really want or what, what would happen if we had the space to do that? Um, you know, what would happen to these networks of intellectuals and writers and artists if they were able to recruit membership, if they were able to really talk more publicly um, about, you know, what they were doing and really were able to create a kind of black organization. I think there would be a lot of support for it, um, you know, according to a lot of the data that, that I collected. 
and a lot of the interviews um, that I did. And so both I want to think of, I want us to think about, you know, the importance of these private spaces and then also the importance of the diaspora and what kinds of um, boundaries have led folks um, to give up, right, on some of, on some of this um, activism. Um, and so last, I just want to um, share a quote, um, you know, from uh, Natividad Torres, uh, who came during Mariel, uh, and she says, after being in the United States, now I believe that this isn't just a Cuban problem. I believe that this is a universal problem. For example, if they were to tell me that I have to leave the United States, I don't know where I would go, because I know no matter where I go, I bear my blackness. Um, and so to conclude, um, I just want to um, read a little bit um, in, and I want to say that I, I argue for the recognition of the Cuban revolution as a radical leftist movement that deeply and directly addressed class inequality and brought universal education and healthcare to the masses in Cuba. At the same time, I argue that the Cuban revolution was not one that served all black people. Rather, it purported to serve black people so that black people would in turn serve the revolution. <clears throat> as Ima Cesar wrote when resigning from the Communist Party in 1956, as quoted in Black Marxism, a doctrine is of value only if it is conceived by us and for us and revised through us. Although Black people experienced social mobility that was unprecedented in Cuba during the early decades of the revolution, the government has determined the reach, direction, and strategy of that mobility. Black people did not have a say in their own liberation. This then means that to be a black revolutionary, you must have a contentious relationship with the state. And so I will end there. Thank you. That was so awesome. That was so great. Danielle, it's really wonderful to have a chance to get to hear about this new project. And I'm incredibly, incredibly excited. And I think it's gonna, you know, the work that you're doing to kind of really shift both our ideas of the revolution, but also of the Cuban diaspora communities here in the US is, is just incredible. I'm like so pumped right now and, and excited to be in a uh, conversation. So I have a couple of um, questions, just, you know, the kind of, came as I was listening to, to your talk. And then we also have some questions that folks have been sending in via the, the Facebook. So for everyone watching, if, if you have questions and you want us to, to get through them, go ahead and um, put them on the Facebook and, and we'll try and go through them uh, now. But you know, the thing that I thought was like really incredible about this, this work that you're doing is this kind of challenging of the idea of the Cuban community in the, in the US as, as monolithic, right? This idea uh, particularly now that we're in election season, right? This is again, the refrain that's every four years around the Cuban exile or Cuban diaspora community in the US is incredibly reactionary, right? Is incredibly conservative and is incredibly white, right? And so what I really appreciated about the kind of nuance that I think your work gives us is this, this way in which we see that actually pro-revolution kind of radical figures were also pushed out of Cuba, right? For a quite, kind of distinct um, uh, uh, set of, of reasons, right? That had to do with this quest for, for kind of addressing uh, structural inequality and, and racial justice. I also really appreciated, you know, the kind of context that I think you give us for thinking about Cuba and the revolution's place within a larger black diasporic history, right? And, and kind of consciousness, because I think there's this way in which post kind of revolution or revolutionary Cuba, right, presents itself as incredibly pro-Black, right, and incredibly um, supportive of Black freedom movements all around the globe, right, and we see this intense contradiction of the okayness of Black freedom movements outside of Cuba, and then these kind of pressures faced by Black revolutionaries inside of Cuba, so I, I really thought that was like incredibly rich and nuanced, and I think does a lot for, um, for our kind of thinking around these these contradictions of of the revolution, so one of the questions that um, that I had in thinking about you know your your talk and that you know I was curious about is you know in terms of this kind of how how can we think about the what made addressing 
structural inequality and structural racism difficult, right, around this question of Blackness and, and race. And, you know, I was curious your thoughts, because on the one hand, I think there's a way in which Cuba, like many other kind of Latin American and Caribbean countries, has a difficulty um, addressing anti-Blackness and structural racism because of a legacy of mestizaje, right? So that narrative and the force of that narrative makes it incredibly difficult on the one hand, right, in a way that is not necessarily unique to Cuba. And then on the other hand, I think the kind of contradictions of class-based, class only class-based analysis, right, a kind of very strict, dogmatic kind of, um, uh, you know, Marxist or communist kind of idea that class, if you solve the class problem, you solve the race problem, right, that uh, race is, is kind of subsumed by class, right. Um, so I was just curious if you could say a little bit more about kind of the, the ways you see those two kind of, I think, I ideologies or, or notions structuring this, the difficulties of addressing uh, structural racism. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, this idea of racial democracy and, and mestizaje certainly is not uh, unique to, didn't start in 1959. And so, you know, prior to the revolution, this idea that um, you know, we are all Cuban, uh, that racial difference uh, doesn't matter, was certainly part of the national narrative. Um, but what happens when, when the revolution comes into power is that they uh, acquire a lot more legitimacy in claiming that, that racial democracy exists. And so, you know, the, the beginning of the revolution is about this balance between increasing support and bringing in all of the marginalized folks, which for the most part were those that were, right, working class and those that were black or mulatto. And so the balance between bringing those folks in and then also keeping white support. And so that balance meant that there were some changes that were made, right, there was desegregation. Um, you know, a lot of the um, exclusive clubs that existed um, you know, the, the end of private schools, which were, you know, exclusive, racially exclusive. All of that happens, uh, some of it uncomfortably, some of it, you know, not, but all of that happens. And at that point, right, I think a lot of the white support started to push back. And so at that point, you know, the revolution then says, you know, well, we've made these changes. Um, we've gotten rid of, you know, all of the informal segregation that existed. And so now we're done. And we're not going to talk about this anymore. And there were folks that were, you know, insiders, you know, that, you know, were telling the leadership and telling, you know, Fidel that they had to address this issue, um, but they just would not touch it. And they didn't touch it for the next, you know, 50 years. And so I think, you know, when we talk about racial prejudice, you know, that's okay. When we talk about, you know, the legacy that pre-59 racism you know, um, still bears, um, you know, on present day, that's okay. Um, but when we talk about employment discrimination, when we talk about, you know, black representation in the media, when we talk about um, neighborhoods, you know, marginal neighborhoods that are still majority black, all of that is really off the table because the government then has to be held accountable for it. And so, you know, I find that still, even though the government has created an organization, Comisión Aponte, um, is what it's called, uh, to address these issues, they still maintain that same narrative that says, you know, we have some legacies from prior to 59, um, but what we really need to do is change people's attitudes through education and workshops. Um, and that remains, you know, the only way um, that you can really talk about this. And so I think that, you know, the revolution has taken that class approach um, or that Marxist approach that only looks at, at, at class-based solutions but if you ask them, they'll say, oh, no, but in the beginning of the revolution, we did all of this. And so, you know, we desegregated, right? We, we talked about, um, you know, being non-racist. Um, and so in that sense, you know, I think that they would argue that, you know, they did more than just a class-based approach. Um, but the fact that all of that was prohibited, um, you know, is, uh, is something that, that remains. And so I think now is really the first time where you see um, you know, a kind of threat to that. And I really think it's connected to this, this kind of access to social media and access to the internet. 
So we actually had a question about social media. And let me tell you the chat here with the questions from Facebook is lighting up, speaking to, I think, the incredible work that, that you're doing. And so we had um, one of these questions. So, uh, hi, Danielle, you touched on social media as uh, part of recent societal changes. Can you say more about the possibilities it opens up for pushing the boundaries of public discourse and discussions about racism? Yeah, so I mentioned it briefly, um, but before people had access, so the kind of, um, I guess, trajectory of internet access is that um, folks, there were some people in the, um, you know, early kind of maybe 2008, 9, 10, that had access to internet maybe through their job. Uh, some people had it through their home, but very few. Um, and then what happens is the government opens up. Um, there were some internet cafes also. Then the government open up, opens up Wi-Fi spaces. And so there are spaces, literal corners on the street in you know, different cities where you can go and you can log on. You buy an internet card and you log on. And so that with that, um, everybody started connecting. And really what you find that people are doing in those Wi-Fi spaces are connecting to social media. They're connecting to Facebook, they're connecting to WhatsApp, um, they're talking to family members. That's mostly what's happening. And so with that, you know, people are then able to share information. Before that, sharing something, you know, that happened, um, you know, that maybe wouldn't, you know, be on the news because it might be something that, you know, is not part of, you know, what the government wants to put out there was shared through USB drives. So people would actually share USB drives um, and, and transfer information that way. So with these Wi-Fi spots, you now have a way to you know, do Facebook Live, uh, you know, get on Instagram, you know, share messages. Um, you know, there have been pictures that have been shared um, of racist incidents that have happened on the bus or in the street. And then people you know, are starting to talk about this. And so a lot of the spaces that were private among family and friends um, and you know, experience that, that were discussed are now being discussed on a much wider platform. Um, and then more recently, um, Cuba's introduced 4G. And so now people have, they don't have to be in the Wi-Fi spots, they have access um, to that you know, on their phones. I wanna preface all of that by saying that, you know, it's still a privilege to be able to afford some of this stuff. And so, you know, not everybody has the money um, to afford 4G, but, but that is, you know, constantly changing. And I think people, um, the access is only growing. And so, you know, because of that, you can then, you know, have some of these discussions. And a group like, you know, 340MS has a platform, you know, that they wouldn't have had ordinarily. Um, and I really think that hip hop is one of the main spaces where these discussions are happening and are going to continue to happen. Um, because that they have really the biggest reach as far as these kinds of expressions. Um, and so that's, that's really where I see, you know, a lot of this going. So we had another question, which I think kind of dovetails about um, what kind of discussions about structural racism are taking place within the Cuban Academy and how are the dialogues with academics doing that research uh, happening outside of Cuba? So perhaps a kind of transnational uh, approach to these questions. Yeah, so um, I mean, uh, most of the, you know, when I was going to Cuba and going to a lot of the meetings, you know, among different organizations, most of the people that were there were academics and writers. And so academics really have always been at the center of these um, organizations and, and at the center of the activism. Um, it's also one of the reasons why I think, you know, hip hop is really important because they have a reach that academics don't necessarily have. But there's a lot of dialogue between those two spaces. Um, which is very, I think, unique to Cuba, you know, it's something at least, you know, in the US that you don't necessarily see. Um, but, you know, hip hop groups and academics um, are continuously working together. And so, um, so those dialogues um, are certainly happening, but there's also limits, you know, in academia, if you're in Cuba, um, on what you can publish, um, you know, and if you're publishing th certain things that might be controversial, you know, that can affect your trajectory as an academic. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, when I was in Cuba, um, when I was doing, you know, research for my book, there was, a, there was an academic who um, was helping me uh, distribute my survey. And she was essentially living, you know, vicariously through me because it was a survey that she couldn't do herself. So she was like, you know, give it to me, I'll, I'll pass it out, you know. And so, 
in that sense, a lot of academics, you know, um, worked with me uh, to get my survey to different spaces um, because they were really interested in the work and, and wanted to do it themselves, but, but couldn't. Uh, so, you know, and I think even though that space is slowly opening up more and more, um, there are still things that, you know, we can say, um, you know, outside of Cuba that, you know, people in Cuba, if they say it, you know, um, there, there are going to be repercussions. So, so we actually got two questions around uh, kind of questions of, of race and spatial differentiation uh, within Cuba and how that might kind of affect how we think about uh, this, this question of both discourses of blackness, but also black revolutionary uh, activism. So the first one is, did you find any different discourses on blackness? I wonder what different discourses are in the central area uh, rather than the eastern side uh, where there are more darker skinned Cubans and then a similar uh, kind of point around this. Uh, can you say anything about the significance of looking at race and racial dynamics involving different regions within Cuba? For example, some Cuban writers and researchers, researchers have pointed to higher rates of racism and poverty as well as larger numbers of black people in the eastern part of the country, in particular uh, the Guantanamo uh, province. Yeah, so um... So some of the experiences that I had with, um, with conversations that were happening across the island were also among hip hop groups. Uh, and so, you know, groups that were, you know, from the Eastern part of the island were coming, you know, into Havana and, and a lot of these discussions were happening. And so for the most part, you know, and also when I, you know, when I went to Santiago, um, I didn't spend much, I haven't spent much time in the central part of the island. And so, most of the research I've done is in Havana and I've also gone to Santiago on the Eastern part. Um, and I found that, um, you know, while there seemed to be more kind of um, organization happening in Havana, a lot of the same dialogues were happening in Santiago de Cuba. Um, and, you know, there were um, a lot of conversations that were happening across the island, uh, particularly among academics um, and artists and so, you know, it's difficult to, to travel in Cuba. It's difficult, um, I think, you know, for, for a lot of folks to get from one place to the next. Uh, but I think, um, you know, the dialogues are, are very similar. Um, as far as, you know, thinking about um, higher rates of racism and poverty, um, it's difficult to quantify. Um, I think that, you know, there are certainly higher rates of poverty, you know, outside of Havana that that's, you know, you can get that um, from observation, but higher rates of racism, you know, is, is more difficult to quantify. It's, it's more difficult to really um, get a sense of, um, you know, there's, there's always the, the kind of stereotype that, you know, the most racist area is in the central um, and more Eastern part of, of Cuba. Um, but I mean, I, you know, we can point to a lot of things, but I'm not, you know, it's frustrating because we don't necessarily have the data to really, to really know, um, you know, what, what, what inequality really looks like. I think perhaps when you look at, you know, the prisons, you know, that, that gives you, um, an idea of, you know, at least who's being targeted, um, you know, by the police, you know, who's being racially profiled, um, and that seems to be similar, you know, throughout the island. Um, so not necessarily a direct answer, but I think, you know, overall conversations are happening, um, you know, across the island, um, but it's just, you know, difficult to know um, what racism looks like, you know, in comparison. So we actually got a question uh, asking about incarceration and political prisoners. So, uh, the question is, could you talk about the role of the dissidents opposition uh, particularly the group of Black political prisoners who have protested carceral treatment as well as racism. Many of them have aligned themselves with human rights groups, and sometimes these groups also silence the same questions of racism they want to bring forward. How do you see this contradiction? Yeah, so part of the reason why uh, I said that this project in the U.S. has changed my approach to Cuba is because, you know, when I was in Cuba, I did not talk to dissidents or anybody who knew anything about dissidents at all, um, mostly because I wanted to come back to Cuba and because I didn't want to be targeted. Uh, and so, you know, this project, you know, and the kind of new kind of opposition that's that's coming out uh, from the left 
is, you know, um, I think, you know, my first introduction, my first kind of intimate connection with uh, folks that are speaking against the government. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think that I haven't seen a lot of uh, communication between folks that are um, political prisoners who are protesting versus activists um, that are, you know, talking about these issues. And I think, you know, that's because of this kind of complex relationship with risk, right? And being an activist um, and really, um, you know, who can you align with? Um, you know, who can you really, um, you know, build connections with? Um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, everything that is happening in the prisons is, you know, very much isolated from everything that's happening outside. Um, and, you know, I've, I've actually talked to people that have come out of prison that aren't necessarily recognized as dissidents, but have talked to me about, you know, the, um, the fact that, you know, most people there are Black and mulatto, and what does that mean about our society uh, as a whole? Um, the other, you know, part of the question is that, you know, um, the Cuban Revolution doesn't talk about race for the same reasons that other larger organizations don't want to talk about race. Um, you know, a lot of times recognizing Blackness and recognizing anti-Blackness um, means that organizations have to make certain commitments, uh, you know, to um, anti-racist work that I think they feel, you know, will either divide or that they're not willing to recognize. And so I think, you know, we see that kind of contradiction everywhere. We see it in the feminist movement. We see it, you know, in the Marxist movement. We see it, um, you know, in, in many, you know, different movements that don't necessarily want to touch this issue of racism. And I think it's similar to the, to the way that the, the revolution doesn't want to touch it. Um, it's seen as something that's divisive. It's, it's seen as something um, that I think is going to be too much work. So we got a question around, uh, you know, you, you spoke about this question of infiltration during your talk. So we got a question around this. Uh, I enjoyed your paper, Danielle. The question of who are the black revolutionaries today in Cuba makes me remember the mistranslation of Roberto uh, Zurbano's article for the New York Times for blacks in Cuba, the revolution hasn't begun. As you well know, he's one of the top critics of structural racism and the myth of racial democracy there while remaining revolutionary. Do you know what is his take or that of other folks in Color uh, Cubano, uh, Cofradia de la Negratud, uh, AR, uh, AAC, et cetera, on state infiltration and intimidation of groups connected to the Black Panther Party, Black Power movements in the 60s, 70s, and beyond? Have you interviewed them about how they regard and remember this history? Yes, so one of the interviews that I read was actually from Sudbara. Um, but I don't always like to say who, who said it because I don't wanna get people in trouble. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I've talked to um, Sudbano and, and, and many others, um, you know, in those groups. And, you know, they, you know, are, are um, aware that, um, that the infiltration exists, I think, there's also um, a certain level of disillusionment that's happening um, and that that is related to this connection and this kind of push that's happening because I think that overall, um, and, and, and the Subano incident with the New York Times I think is a big part of that, right? Because Subano has always been um, a, a supporter of the revolution. And so for him to you know, have been you know, demoted, for him to you know, have experienced consequences because of, um, because of that, you know, New York Times article, um, that really made people think, you know, nobody is kind of uh, immune, you know, to this. Uh, and so I think that, you know, I've talked to them, they have always been in solidarity with, you know, um, not only those movements and the, but the people that have, you know, been involved in those movements. And so a lot of the people that I talked to here on the US side, um, you know, still have relationships. And so when a lot of those activists, you know, that are in Cuba, like Subbano, you know, like uh, Tomas, you know, Robaina, when they come over um, to the US, that's who they, you know, uh, talk with, that's who they visit with. And so, you know, that relationship still exists, even though, you know, um, some of them had to, you know, come over here as a result of that. 
um, you know, but certainly, you know, um, Subano is still, you know, involved um, and still working. Um, but I think that that, that incident really um, made people kind of reflect on, you know, uh, what, what some of the consequences are even for, you know, the staunchest supporters of the revolution. So I had kind of a, a selfish question, which is I wanted to hear more about the larger project. So I know that this part really focused on the question of like, how can we think about uh, pol politics and kind of black power politics in particular as a, a kind of driver of, of migration. And so I was actually curious about the oral histories you did in terms of people talking about being in the US, right? And I think we have uh, so I'm, I'm teaching a class on Black and Latino intersections, and we read Black Cuban, Black American this semester, right? Um, so we have these texts that I think really go into these questions around how we can think about race and politics within the Cuban um, diasporic or exile community in, in the U.S., but also with kind of um, Black Cubans and African Americans or other uh, Black kind of diasporic groups in, in the U.S. So I was curious kind of if you could talk about, uh, tell us a little bit about what, how that comes up in, in the new research you're doing. Yes, um, so we have interviewed, so the interviews uh, at first we're going to focus just on folks that came in the 60s and 70s, but then we started interviewing their children and their grandchildren and and so the, the project is not only um, about Cubans that came over here, but also black Cubans that were born here. And so a lot of the um, conversations that we've had, you know, have been on these issues of, you know, anti-black racism within the Cuban community. Um, spaces that we know like Little Havana or Hialeah that are, you know, the core of the Cuban enclave uh, were closed off to black Cubans. Black Cubans could not rent in those places, um, you know, could not, um, you know, be in those places past, you know, doing business there. And so they created their own communities. Um, Alapata in Miami is one neighborhood where Black Cubans settled uh, because they weren't, you know, able to settle in the other um, places where, where white Cubans were, were, um, were building community. And so they ended up building their own communities. Um, and so what's fascinating about it is that, you know, we've interviewed all of these um, Black Cubans and most of them knew each other or their parents knew their, you know, <laughs> of someone, right? There was always only one or two degrees of separation um, because, right, that community had to become so close knit uh, because they were excluded from that, that larger, you know, enclave. And so, you know, I think one of the biggest um, issues that I found, you know, about, you know, building that community is that, you know, Black Cubans um, ended up building with other Black immigrant communities, but not necessarily African Americans. And so a lot of the tension that exists between Cubans and African Americans were kind of transferred on to Black Cubans. Um, and there seemed to be, you know, a feeling that, you know, we're kind of living in this limbo, right? We're not quite accepted by, you know, the white larger Cuban community, but we're also not quite accepted by the African American community either. There were some exceptions, but overall, I think that was really the sentiment. And so, you know, building relationships with, you know, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Haitians was um, more of the, the common experience that black Cubans had. Um, and overall, you know, if we, if we look at, um, you know, a lot of this became about um, housing discrimination, because if we look at Hialeah today, which is working class, right, so this is not a, a you know, an elite, right, neighborhood, um, we find that it's 95% white, and it's 95% Cuban. And so, you know, these spaces still remain um, racially segregated, and, you know, Black Cubans, even that were born here, or second and third generation, um, continue to build, you know, their relationships with the same communities that their parents and grandparents did, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I could, I could talk about it for three hours, but, <laughs> but hopefully that answers some of your, your uh, wonderings. <laughs> we need a part two, obviously, because this all sounds also so awesome and, and amazing. So, so we have to do part two of this, uh, for sure. 
So I, you know, I, I want to be conscious of time and, and we're at 410. So I, I wanted to like, just one last closing question, if you, if you'll indul indulge me, yes. um, and then uh, I'll hand it over to Paloma to, to, to send us off. But, uh, you know, I have a colleague, uh, Stephen Asuna, who does a lot of anti-black uh, blockade work, right? And so I was just curious, one of the, you know, one of the kind of arguments that uh, he and other kind of activists here who are U.S. solidarity activists have, have made is that the blockade is, is opposing that blockade is actually a racial justice issue, right? That Black Cubans are the most impacted by the blockade. So I, I just want to kind of hear, hear your thoughts on that in, in relation to this project that you're doing and, and if you have any other kind of thoughts on, on that question of how we as folks who are in the US, right? And our government is, is, is actually strengthening the blockade, right? Uh, how we should think about this. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when, um, when, when I talk to people in Cuba, you know, they're um, always paying attention to US politics because, you know, the, the changes that are being made uh, directly affect you know, folks that are there, whether it be travel, you know, remittances, uh, tourism, um, you know, a bloqueo. And so, you know, certainly, you know, I think Black Cubans are most affected by it. And I also think that, you know, because um, Cuba is a majority Black country, and because most of the folks that left Cuba um, in the 60s and 70s, who make up the majority of those that are pro embargo, um, you know, there's a relationship there, right? The the anti blackness that exists among you know those exiles that came over, you know, um, uh, you know, is still connected is connected to right this kind of um, indifference about you know what happens uh, to Cubans um, economically. Um, what's also I think very interesting is that. And I kind of expected it, but I but I was you know wanted to make sure, is that you know blackness changes you know the way that people position themselves or the way that Cubans position themselves in the U.S. And so I talked to folks that um, you know some of them were socialized in Cuban communities and did you know think of themselves as Republican, um, but many were you know pro um, engagement with Cuba. Many were, um, you know, pro, um, um, you know, ending the blockade. But also, what was really interesting was that most people that we interviewed were Democrats. Of those that were Republicans, they ceased being Republicans in 2008 when Barack Obama ran. And so, you know, so many Cubans that we talked to said, well, you know, we were Republicans because that's what Cubans do. Um, but then when Barack Obama ran, I could not, you know, vote for, you know, his challenger because it's the first black president and I am black. And, you know, this was an important historical moment for me. And since then, right, they do not support Trump and they're firmly in the Democratic Party. And so that, you know, voting, um, you know, because of, you know, race and because of, you know, their position as black Cubans, then kind of started this process of really thinking about what it means to be Republican and what it means to oppose certain policies toward Cuba and what it means, you know, um, to, you know, vote with the, you know, the mass rather than to really kind of think about, you know, where you lie ideologically. Um, and so I thought, you know, that was, um, that was one of the, you know, uh, points that I, that I didn't necessarily expect. But I think, you know, overall, um, you know, Black Cubans also were much more likely to visit their family. And so they have that connection with Cuba, um, you know, that I think others don't, um, that, you know, don't support um, lifting the embargo. You know, when you're visiting family, you know, when you're still in contact with family, you know, that makes a big difference as far as how you see Cuba and what you think is best for, for, for you know, the people that are there. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yes. Thank you both of you, Dr. Lebron, Dr. Cleveland. We are always very proud when we're able to create spaces of interdisciplinary transnational discussion. And this was a fascinating discussion. If you're interested in this topic, next week we're hosting an event about race and literature in the Caribbean. We're partnering with Stanford University and University of Florida. So tune in for another fascinating event.
Thank you, everyone. Bye.